Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello students, this is Dr. Ajay Kumar Singh, Assistant Professor, Faculty of Law. This is my second lecture and today I am going to discuss different sources of Muslim law. So in this lecture, I would like to highlight various schools of Muslim law. So let me correct it. In this is my second lecture and uh, I would like to highlight different schools of Muslim law. Whenever we talk about a school, we talk about origin of law. For example, if we talk about a school of law, it means we are talking about origin, it means uh, different thought, how many scholars they have understood law in their own understanding. For example, uh, there are different schools like analytical school, in law, sociological school, historical schools. So, Austin, Salmon, Kelson, they are follower of analytical school and they have understood law in their own understanding. They have tried to define law as law is command of sovereign. So, you see Austin says that law is command of sovereign. It means law is commanded by, controlled by sovereign. So, sovereignty lies in the hands of people. So, all these things belong to a particular ideology that is analytical school. So, what I am trying to justify, I am just trying to justify that school means ideology. So, in, Muslim, in this lecture, I am, I am going to discuss different ideology, different schools of Muslim law how different schools came into existence and how they have understood different means scholars belonging to different ideology they have defined they have propagated they have developed islamic law so as you all might be knowing that prophet muhammad he was a spiritual head as well as administrative head of islam so whatever he did whatever he said was treated as law for that community and that his sayings and preachings are treated as sunnat of prophet muhammad traditions of prophet muhammad model behavior of prophet muhammad so these things are considered as sunnat of prophet muhammad as we have already seen in sources of muslim law that there are four important primary sources quran sunnat isma and kiyas so, Sunnah is second important source of Muslim law. Sunnah is treated as traditions of Prophet Muhammad. So, Prophet Muhammad was universally accepted spiritual as well as administrative head of Islamic commonwealth. So, Muslims they have common belief whether they belong to Sunni sect or Shia sect. They have common belief in prophethood they believe that prophet muhammad was his messenger prophet muhammad was the last messenger of god whatever he said whatever he did for the for the betterment of society so they uh, believe in prophethood but after the death of prophet muhammad a big question before islam was to find out bona fide successor so after the death of Prophet Muhammad, when he died in 632 AD, as you might, you all might be knowing that there was a big question that who will succeed Islam, who would be bona fide successor of Islam, because there was a dispute between two groups. One group was being had by one group. One group was being represented by Aisha Begum wife of Prophet Muhammad and another group 
was being led by represented by Fatima. So, there was a dispute between two groups. One group was advocating or arg arguing that election should be conducted and by conducting election a spiritual head or administrative head should be elected. But Fatima daughter of Prophet Muhammad she was not I agree with she was not satisfied with the argument given by Aisha Begum. She wanted Fatima wanted that the successor of Prophet Muhammad should come from his family. So, he all means she wanted Fatima wanted that the bona fide successor of Prophet Muhammad should come from his family, his blood uh, relatives. But there was dispute, no consensus was there. So, ultimately it was decided by majority of Muslims that election should be conducted. So, Aisha Begum, she was leading that group and she was representing majority of Muslims at that time. So, she decided to conduct an election. Election was accordingly election was conducted and in that election Abu Bakr was elected as religious head, spiritual head of that uh, by majority of Muslims they elected Abu Bakr as their religious or spiritual leader. So, in this way Abu Bakr was elected as religious head, administrative head and majority of Muslims were in favor of Abu Bakr. So, Abu Bakr with the help of his followers established a new sect in Islam. The sect is treated as considered as Sunni sect. So, I am just trying to give logic behind uh, giving the particular nomenclature. Abu Bakr tried to convince his followers that we people are follower of Sunnat of Prophet Muhammad. We people are follower of traditions of Prophet Muhammad. So, all those Muslims who believed in Sunnat of Prophet Muhammad were called Sunnis. So, Abu Bakr gave a specific name Sunni and he argued that those Muslims who believed in traditions of Prophet Muhammad, Sunnat of Prophet Muhammad should come with me, join, they should join my hands and they should come forward to represent this uh, sect, Sunni sect. So, in this way Abu Bakr with the, with the help of his followers formed a new sect in Islam that is called Sunni sect. So, you see the first split took place in Islam, Islam divided into two sect. One was being headed by Abu Bakr and Abu Bakr formed new sect Sunni sect. Since Fatima was not satisfied with uh, all these things which were uh, being controlled by Abu Bakr and his followers, so she decided to disassociate from that group and Fatima being female could not be appointed as a successor of Prophet Muhammad. So, she decided to nominate Ali, Ali was her husband. So, she decided Fatima decided to nominate Ali as religious as well as spiritual head of Islam and in this way Ali with the help of his followers formed a new sect in Islam and that sect is treated as Shia sect. Shia literally means a small group within larger group. So, Ali became you see in this way Ali became a spiritual head of Shia sect and Ali along with his followers formed a new sect in Islam and they were called Shia Muslims. So, you see in this way after uh, when split took place in Islam, Islam divided into two sects Sunni sect and Shia sect. Though Fatima and Ali they were representing very small group of Muslims, though Muslims were in minority who were with Ali, but they were not satisfied with Abu Bakr. So, they disassociated themselves from Abu Bakr and 
Ali with the help of his followers formed separate sect in Islam and they were called Shia Muslims. So in this way we can see that Sunni sect and Shia sect came into existence after when a split took place between these two groups. So, the important thing is that all students you need to understand that with the help of this slide I am just trying to show a slide so that you can get entire information. You just look at this after death of Prophet Muhammad in 632 AD. Islam divided into two sects, Sunni sect and Shia sect. Follower of Sunnah, Prophet were uh, of Prophet, they were called Sunni, as I said. And Ali, who was representing minority group, Muslims who were in minority, so he became first Imam. So, I just want to share this content. With the help of this content, you may have idea about. So, I think uh, you all have understood the origin of Sunni sect and Shia sect, how these two important sect came into existence. Now, you all need to understand two things, Sunni Muslims as well as Shia Muslims, they believe in prophethood, they have common belief in prophethood, they have utmost respect for, for Prophet Muhammad they have utmost respect for Quran, they have utmost respect for Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. So, you all need to understand that whether Muslim belongs to Sunni sect or Shia sect, they have common belief in prophethood, they have common belief in Quran and Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad. The only thing which makes difference between these two sect is the follower of Abu Bakr they believe in Abu Bakr, they believe in preachings and sayings of Abu Bakr, that is why they were called Sunnis when is, and uh, there was no consensus that who will that who would succeed uh, Islam after death of Prophet Muhammad and that is why split took place uh, in Islam. So, this is the common thing between these two sects, Sunni sect and Shia sect. So, Imam Ali became first Imam and followers of Ali, they believe in, they have utmost respect even Ali. Ali himself had utmost respect for Prophet, had utmost respect for Quran, he had utmost respect for Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad, but after the appointment of Imam, Pra Ali wanted to give new message for his followers for the betterment of his community. So, even his preachings and sayings, preachings of Ali was also treated as law for Shia Muslims. So, in this way Abu Bakr became first caliph of Sunni sect and you all know, you all might be knowing about caliph, the post of caliph was um, elected post, Abu Bakr was first caliph and you, you I would like to mention this uh, thing here that post of caliphate was abolished in 1924, that is a matter of history. In 1924 during Turkey war, the post of caliphate was abolished by the Britishers. So, but imamship it is said that that post cannot be abolished, that is a permanent perpetual post. So, you need to understand this thing. So, you see here when Abu Bakr became first caliph of Sunni sect, he tried to expand his boundaries, his frontiers of kingdom and he was succeeded in expanding the frontiers of his kingdom. But in 634 AD, you can see on this screen, in 634 AD Abu Bakr died. After the death of Abu Bakr, Omar became second caliph. Osman became third caliph. You see, Osman was the first person who tried to compile Quran. Since revelation of message, revelation of God were in scattered form. So, Osman was the third caliph 
who try to collect scattered revelation of Quran and in this way scattered information revelation of God were collected by different peoples during the reign of during the period of Osman and Osman was the first person who got this credit to compile Quran as a great epic for Islam. So, this is one important thing which you need to understand at this in this head. Now, come to first, fourth uh, caliph, it is written in textbook that Ali was the first imam of Shia sect, but Osman was assassinated. After his assassination, Ali became fourth caliph of Sunni sect. So, you see how he wanted to put his desire, his wishes and he wanted to control both the sect, Sunni sect and Shia sect. So, in this way Ali became fourth caliph of uh, Sunni sect. He still, you see even he was imam of Shia sect as well as fourth caliph of Sunni sect. What I am trying to justify, I am just trying to justify that how different schools in Muslim law emerged and who is the follower of, who is the founder of particular school and what he did in for the development of Islamic jurisprudence. So, this is all about your split in Islam, how in this way Sunni sect and Shia sect came into existence. Now, come to another, I, another important thing which I want to share. So, with the help of this slide, you all, you all would be in position to understand different schools of Sunni sect. I have just, you see, referred Hanafi school, second is Maliki, third is Safi and fourth school is Hanbali school. You, you can just memorize it, you can just uh, you, you can see on your screen that after the death of Abu Bakr, the burden lie, the burden was on those Muslims who had knowledge about Islamic students. You need to understand that after the death of Prophet Muhammad, Omar and Osman, they were elected as they succeeded as second and third caliph, they were involved in expanding their frontiers of their kingdom. On the other hand, the law knowing person, the Muslims who had knowledge about Islamic jurisprudence, they were trying to give new interpretation to Islamic jurisprudence. In this way, the first school of Sunni sect emerged that is Hanafi school. It is said that Abu Hanifa was a great scholar of his time and he was a great scholar of Iraq, uh, Kufa, Kufa is a city where he lived. So, it was stated uh, by different scholars Abu, like Abdul Rahim that Abu Hanifa used to give new interpretation to the Islamic jurisprudence. He was accepted as a great scholar of his time. He was appointed as a Qazi, uh, Qazi by the state, by the king. So, he was assigned duty to give a new interpretation and decide disputes of the state at that time, but he refused to accept that post. Abu Hanifa did not accept that post which was offered by the caliph. As a result of that, Abu Hanifa was confined at this place, Kufa at, at Kufa city. So, that was that Kufa city was very small city at that time and where he was confined, he was put behind the bar. So, people of that time, they thought that Abu Hanifa who was uh, giving new interpretation to Islamic Jew students had been confined. So, they used to go to visit to see 
देयर स्पिरिचुअल हेड इन दिस वे अबू हनीफा बिकेम सो पॉपुलर दैट मुस्लिम्स एट दैट टाइम दे बिलीव दैट अबू हनीफा इनजस्टिस वॉज डन टू द अबू हनीफा सो अबू हनीफा हु डिडेंट एक्सेप्ट दैट पोस्ट कॉजी इन दिस वे he tried to give new interpretation so how abu hanifa was in favor of evolving new rules to resolve to solve the problems of society so he convinced his followers abu hanifa with the help of his followers formed a new ideology new school in sunni sect the follower of abu hanifa were called as hanafi sunni muslims so you all need to understand that abu hanifa is the founder of hanafi school abu hanifa with the help of his followers formed a new sub sect in shia sunni sect and in this way hanafi abu hanifa established hanafi school the follower of abu hanifa they they are called as hanafi sunni muslims do you see basically they are sunni muslims but since they are follower of abu hanifa they are follower of ideology of hanafi school so that is why they are called hanafi sunni muslims so they they have they are diff, means they follow different procedure practices prescribed by abu hanifa so in this way abu hanifa succeeded in establishing new ideology new school in sunni sect the name of that school is hanafi school majority of indian muslims majority of muslims in pakistan in indonesia in syria they belong to hanafi school hanafi school is most popular school ideology of sunni sect majority of muslims in the world they belong to so they belong to hanafi ideology hanafi school you need to understand and what is the contribution of hanafi school i would like to highlight some few important things so that you can have get you you can have complete understanding about hanafi school you see hanafi school established a principle that at the time of marriage at least two muslims must be present as a witness so in the absence of two witnesses marriage would not be treated as valid marriage so this school hanafi school emphasized on presence of witness at the time of marriage this is one important contribution of hanafi school and another important contribution of hanafi school is hidayah hidayah is an important text like uh, you you can also understand that different schools have different each and every school has its own textbook and that textbook that epic is that textbook is collection of local customs preachings and sayings of that founder of that school you can just understand in this way so al hidaya that is textbook in brief that is also referred as hidaya so hidaya also prescribes certain norms procedures which must be followed by sunni muslims and all those muslims who follow abu hanifa they were called as hanafi sunni muslims and majority of muslims in the world presently they belong to hanafi ideology hanafi schools so their marriage you see firstly they are muslim and then after it will be decided that they belong to a particular sect whether they belong to hanafi school or they belong to maliki maliki school so their marriage their maintenance their dower their gift all these things would be regulated by that particular ideology by that particular school for example if both the parties belong to hanafi sun school muslim male and muslim female both are follower of hanafi school 
so their marriage would be conducted in the light of things prescribed in hidayah the things prescribed by abu hanifa so you all need to understand this thing now come to second ideology uh, that is maliki school you you just look at this so maliki school was established by malik ibn anas at madina so this maliki school came into existence and maliki school tried to resolve the disputes abu means malik ibn anas he was in favor of uh, evolving new rules by consensus opinion in this way during his period during this period uh, means during period of malik ibn anas isma was promoted consensus opinion that we have already seen in sources of law isma was promoted by this school and uh, in this way abu anas malik ibn, uh, ibn anas tried to convince his followers that muslims should join and muslims should follow those local customs which were prevailing at madina in those days so what he did malik ibn anas with the help of his followers tried to convince the muslims of madina that they should follow local customs in addition to quran and sunnat so you need to understand that quran and sunnat these two things are very important sources of muslim law in in addition to these two sunni muslims who belong to maliki school they accepted isma as a third important source in isma and local customs of madina as a fourth important source of source to decide their problem in this way the second third school is safi school you can you i am just uh, sharing this content on your screen safi school was established by a safi in egypt and he also tried to he since he was follower of sunni sect he also tried to established new rule of law for muslims of that particular country and try to develop qiyas during his period qiyas was qiyas as i have already highlighted in my previous lecture that qiyas was considered as fourth important source of muslim law so during his period qiyas was accepted as uh, important source of law he tried to convince his followers that every matter of the society could be resolved in the light of quran in the light of sunnat failing which if that matter could not be resolved with the help of quran and sunnat then muslims should decide resolve their problem in the light of standard things which are already decided or which are mentioned in sunnat or quran so in this way you see as safi also Uh, succeeded in establishing his ideology in sunni sect and his followers were called as safi sunni muslims and the last sunni school which emerged as a fourth important school of sunni sect that is hanbali school and that school originated emerged in baghdad capital of iraq right now so ibn hanbal is founder of that school it is said that ibn hanbal was a great scholar of his time he established a separate ideology in sunni sect he also convinced his followers that you people should follow quran you people should follow sunnat of prophet muhammad and in addition to these two the people of baghdad iraq they should follow local customs and what he was preaching and what he was saying for the betterment of his followers 
his preaching and saying should be accepted as so followers of ibn hanbal they accepted ibn hanbal as their spiritual and religious set followers they believed in uh, ibn hanbal and in this way hanbali ideology hanbali school emerged as fourth important school of sunni sect so main contribution of hanbali school in development of islamic law is they also relied on quran and sunnah they could not go beyond these two important text of islam quran and sunnah in addition to this uh, ibn hanbal he also emphasized local customs he tried to convince his followers that local customs should be promoted whatever customs practices ancient practices were prevailing in that society should be accepted by muslims so you see what i am just trying to the book of that period is mushan ul imam hanbal that is a text of hanbali school and that book textbook is a collection of about 50000 of local customs so with the help of that local customs with the help of that book those muslims who are the follower of hanbali ideology hanbali school they decide their dispute in the light of that book that text they uh, do their daily activities day to day activities in the light of things stated in that book so what is important to understand you all need to understand that hanafi school maliki school safi school and hanbali school these four important schools of sunni sect emerged and every school has its own founder its spiritual head majority of sunni muslims belong to as i said hanafi school majority of sunni muslims or hanafi they belong to hanafi schools and rest all they belong to maliki safi and hanbali so now come to few important things which uh, hanafi school has recognized first is they have also recognized irregular marriage when the types of marriage would be discussed in that head i would like to throw some light on uh, different types of marriages so you see one important contribution of hanafi school is recognition of irregular marriage marriage may be valid or void in in addition to these two marriages hanafi school has discovered another important marriage that marriage is known as irregular marriage after the removal of irregularity that marriage can be regularized marriage may be either valid sahi marriage or may be void that is batil that is called as a batil marriage in under muslim law and third types of marriages irregular marriage so why it is called irregular marriage because of irregularity and after the removal of irregularity that marriage can be regularized let let us take an example with the help of that example you all would be in position to understand this thing this kind of marriage irregular marriage according to hanafi school muslim marriage muslim male can marry with four means muslim male can have four wives at a time this is already stated in so every muslim can have four wives at a time but if he marries with fifth wife so marriage with fifth one marriage with fifth female is irregular marriage according to hanafi school that marriage is not void but that marriage is irregular irregular marriage is as good as valid marriage that is irregular because of uh, because of irregularity and irregularity is here marriage with fifth female 
so how that irregularity can be removed by that muslim male muslim male can give divorce to any one of his four wives by giving divorce to his any one of four wives muslim male can remove that difficulty that irregularity and after the removal of that difficulty marriage with fifth female can be regularized so even you see how <coughs> they have discovered new mechanism new things to legitimize fifth marriage so here fifth marriage with fifth female is treated as irregular marriage and after the removal of that irregularity marriage can be considered as valid marriage sahi marriage i have already highlighted that how um, how irregularity can be removed by muslim male muslim male has liberty to give divorce to any of his four wives by giving divorce to his wife he can regularize that marriage and then fifth marriage with fifth female would be treated as valid marriage sahi marriage valid marriage in muslim law is treated as sahi marriage as i have already told you so i think you this is the first contribution of hanafi school irregular marriage uh, they have recognized a different form of marriage second important thing is that maliki school of sunni sect has prescribed that at the time of marriage no maliki sunni muslim male should pay less than 10 dirham to his wife as a dower so minimum dower prescribed by maliki school is 10 dirham so actually dower is a token of respect given by muslim husband at the time of his marriage so according to maliki school no maliki muslim male should give less than 10 dirham to his wife at the time of marriage so this is another important feature of maliki school which you all you, which you all need to understand second important uh, next important thing is that sunni law Han hanafi particularly hanafi school doesn't recognize life interest of hiba hiba that is gift in muslim law so life interest you can just i have mentioned that component uh, on this screen hiba life interest so you can see this hiba here means a gift when, when gift is made by muslim to a non muslim to the doni in favor of doni that gift is known as hiba that uh, that i will i would like to discuss it in detail when hiba gift would be discussed in that chapter you will get entire information about hiba here you all need to understand that where muslim donor wants to retain something in a gift so life interest means if a sunni donor wants to make a gift of his property in favor of doni only for the life time of doni after the death of doni that property will revert back to the donor this kind of concept is recognized by shia sect but sunni sect doesn't recognize hanafi school does not recognize concept of life interest of hiba so according to hanafi school once gift is made in favor of doni once gift is always gift donor cannot retain anything from that property which he is trying to gift in favor of doni so this is another important feature of sunni sect you i think you all must have understood the things which i have just discussed in sunni sect so this is all about uh, all about your different schools of sunni sect now i would like to di discuss different schools of shia sect as i said after the death of prophet muhammad ali became first imam of shia sect ali established a new sect in islam that and the follower of shia follower of imam follower of ali they were called shia muslims so majority of indian shia muslims they belong to itna sharia i would like to discuss uh, it in detail so you can just see on this screen 
with the help of this screen you can get entire information about CI school. I have mentioned in this you see Sia school Ali first Imam Ali had two sons Hassan and Hussain Ali being rule of succession as you all might be knowing that rule of inheritance succession in Muslim law. So, according to rule of inheritance after the death of Ali Hassan became second Imam and Hussain became third Imam I as I said he had two sons Hassan and Hussain. So, there was no dispute between Hassan and Hussain and after the death of Ali as a rule of succession eldest son became second Imam, Hassan became second Imam and Hussain became third Imam. After the death of Hussain his son Jainul Abdeen I have already mentioned Jainul Abdeen he became fourth Imam. So, you see from 632 AD, 632 AD when Prophet Muhammad expired after the death of Prophet Muhammad Ali was appointed as a religious head of Shia sect. So, from Ali to Hussain there was no split in Shia sect even Jainul Abdeen was the four, fourth Imam and up to this period there was no split in Shia sect. Shia sect remained intact. Jainul Abdeen had two sons. Now, you can see on this screen look at this Jayad and Muhammad Bakir. Jainul Abdeen had two sons as I said Jayad and Muhammad Bakir. So, due to some mental fraction Jayad was disinherited and Ab Muhammad Bakir was appointed as fifth Imam. Majority of Shia Muslims at that time they accepted Muhammad Bakir as fifth Imam, but those Shia Muslims who were in minority they accepted Jayad as their religious head spiritual head. They did not accept though Muslims though who were in minority who were in favor of Jayad they did not accept Muhammad Bakir as their Imam, they accepted Jayad as fifth Imam. So, here you see just you can see that there was there was a family dispute when when uh, Jainul Abdeen died. So, due to family dispute those Shia Muslims who were in minority they accepted Jayad as their religious head and in this way Jayad being dissatisfied with his brother formed a new school new ideology in Shia sect. In this way in this way Jayadiya school emerged and Jayadiya school is treated as first school of Shia sect. So, Jayad with his follow with the help of his followers formed a new sub sect in Shia sect and the followers of Jayad were called Jayadi Shia Muslims. So, in this way those Shia Muslims who do, those Shia Muslims who were in minority they believed they accepted Jayad as their religious said they accepted him and they recognized Jayad as a fifth Imam. So, here you see Muhammad Bakir majority of Shia Muslims they accepted Muhammad Bakir as fifth Imam. But Muslims who were in minority they accepted Jayad and Jayad with the help of his few people few Muslims who were though they they were in minority they were not representing majority Shia Muslims. So, Jayad formed a separate school ideology in Shia sect and they were called Jayadi Shia Muslims. Now, this is the first as I said this is the first school of Shia sect. Muhammad Bakir had one son Jafar Sadiq. So, after Muhammad Bakir Jafar Sadiq became sixth Imam. So, you see how whatever Muhammad Bakir said whatever Jafar Sadiq said preachings of Jafar Sadiq is, is saying of Jafar Sadiq was treated as law for Shia community at that time. 
So there was no uh, dispute regarding preaching and sayings of fifth and sixth Imam. Shia Muslims they had accepted them as their religious or spiritual head. Jafar Sadiq had two sons, Ismail and Musa Kazim. Ismail and Musa, with the help of this screen, you without this screen, you it would be difficult for you to understand uh, different schools of Shia sects. So, I have just made this slide so that you can get entire information about Shia school. Jafar Sadiq had two sons, Ismail and Musa Kazim. Ismail was elder son of Jafar Sadiq, but he was disinherited by his father. His father did not like him. So, Musa Kazim was appointed as his successor. In this way, Musa Kazim became seventh Imam of Shia sect. You see the series of Imam, Musa Kazim became seventh Imam. Ismail was, you see, since Ismail was disinherited by his father, his father was not satisfied. So, being dissatisfied, Ismail with the help of his followers formed a new subsect in Shia sect and that is Ismailia school. So, those Muslims, Shia Muslims who were follower of Ismail were called Ismailia, though they were called as followers of Ismail. So, in this way, though Shia Muslims were in minority who were uh, express their belief in Ismail, they accepted Ismail as their seventh Imam. They did not accept Musa Kazim, but majority of Shia Muslims, they accepted Musa Kazim as a seventh Imam. Few Muslims, though they were in minority, they accepted Ismail as a seventh Imam. Ismail with, with the help of his followers established new ideology in Shia sect and that is second school of Shia sect, Ismailia school. Well, I was talking about different school of Shia sect. So, in that context, I have highlighted two important schools of Shia sect which emerged in the first is Jayadis and second is uh, Ismailia school. So, you see, we have seen as of now, we have seen that the emergence of different school in Shia sect was nothing but family dispute. Rather, we can see that these schools emerged in Shia sect as due to family dispute, due to uh, dispute of succession, inheritance. The third important school of Shia sect is Ithna Ishariya school. This school is also referred as Imamiya school. The follower of this school is also known as Twelveler. So, Ithna Ishariya school is a very popular school of Shia sect and you see how this school emerged and what is the contribution of Ithna Ishariya school. I would like to highlight a few important points of Ithna Ishariya school. You see, Ithna Sharia school is considered as most popular schools among Shias. Majority of Indian Shia Muslims belong to Ithna Sharia school. The main contribution of this school is recognition of temporary marriage, recognition of muta marriage. I have just uh, shown you. Uh, you see, just you, you look at this. In this screen, I have tried to highlight emergence of Ismailia different schools of Shia sect and Ithna Sharia school contribution of Ithna Sharia school. Muta marriage I have already mentioned uh, in this slide. So, Muta, uh, Ithna Sharia school recognized Muta marriage that is temporary marriage. Muta here means marriage for pleasure. So, muta marriage was recognized by Ithna Sharia school just to avoid prostitution. So, you need to understand, you must understand the logic behind recognition of this temporary marriage is the Muslims who were follower of Ithna Sharia, they argued that 
Muslims they had to live away from their home either for trade journey or for war. So, they had to live away from their home. So, they used to satisfy their sexual desire with prostitutes. So, in order to avoid that evil, they decided to recognize temporary marriage. So, that Muslims who had to live away from their home could not involve in that unethical practices. So, this is the logic behind recognition of temporary marriage which uh, followers of Itna Isharia have given and it seems logical in this way ki that they Muslims uh, in those days they had to live away from either for business purposes or for war purposes. So, the beauty of you see the salient feature of this act is uh, this marriage mutual marriage is any Shia Muslim male can marry with a female muta marriage by specifying the nature of marriage that the Muslim male is willing to marry with such a female and the nature of that marriage would be muta marriage temporary marriage. It would be for a day, for a week, for a month or for a year. So, period must be specified by the Muslim male otherwise if marriage if time is not mentioned time is not specified then that muta marriage would be considered as permanent marriage and Muslim female would be entitled to get all the benefit which she can claim against her husband in permanent marriage in nikah in regular marriage. So, you need to understand that the party particularly Muslim male who is going to contract marriage with female muta marriage. So, he must specify the period for which he is going to marry with such female. If period is not mentioned in date, in document, in marriage date, then in the absence of specification of time period that marriage would be considered as permanent marriage, regular marriage and that Muslim female would be entitled to get all the things benefits which she can claim against her husband in regular marriage. You need to understand this point. Another important feature of this muta marriage is that Muslim male has to follow all the prescribed things, all the requirement which he is obliged to follow in regular marriage. For example, if Muslim male is willing to contract muta marriage, temporary marriage, he will have to make an offer that is known as ijab and that offer must be accepted by female that is known as kabul with certain consideration, consideration here mehar. So, even in muta marriage something must be paid by Muslim male at the time of marriage to his wife to whom he is going to marry. So, Muslim male after paying some certain amount mehar to his wife at the time of marriage, he may contract that marriage and that marriage would be treated as muta marriage if time is specified in that uh, marriage document. So, offer and acceptance must be these two formalities must be done by the parties Muslim male as well as female with specific condition with that mehar must be also paid by Muslim husband to his wife. Now, you see in this way if Muslim Shia Muslim male contracts muta marriage temporary marriage after the expiry of that period for which Muslim male has contracted temporary marriage muta marriage that Muslim male would not be under obligation to pay maintenance to that female because marriage is performed by the parties for a specific period for a specific period. So, that is why after the expiry of that period Muslim male is not obliged to give maintenance to his wife. Contrary to this in regular marriage Muslim female is entitled to get maintenance from her husband. 
but in muta marriage muslim female cannot get maintenance from her husband because dowry is already paid at the time of marriage and in marriage contract there is a specific agreement between the parties that this marriage is would be expiring after few years few months so after the expiry of that said period marriage expires ipso facto without act of the parties and in muta marriage muslim husband cannot be compelled by the court to give maintenance to his wife so this is another important feature you all need to understand so in this way uh, what i <coughs> have highlighted in this lecture different school of sunni sect how islam divided into sunni sect and shia sect you all need to understand that sunni as well as shia muslims they have common belief one thing is common between these two sect and that is both means bo both muslims muslims who are the follower of sunni sect and shia sect they believe in prophethood they believe that prophet muhammad was their prophet they also believe that quran is important text for them they also they have also utmost respect for sunnat of prophet muhammad traditions of prophet muhammad and when split took after the death of prophet muhammad when islam divided into sunni sect and shia sect so sunni muslims they believe in the preachings of abu bakr and shia muslims they believe they believe in saying and preachings of ali so in addition to this i have also covered a peculiar form of uh, marriage in itna isharia uh, school and second important thing is that which you all need to understand that the shariat act 1937 section 2 is very important which talks about 10 subject matters of muslims which are exclusively regulated controlled by shariat act 10 subject matters stated in section 2 of the shariat act would be applicable to the muslims only and in these two in this in these 10 subject matters only muslim pure muslim personal law would be applicable in addition to this you all need to understand that there is a special marriage act 1954 if both the parties are muslim they have contracted their marriage in accordance with the provision of special marriage act 1954 they would not you see in that case muslim personal law would not be applicable so before i end this before i complete my lecture you all need to understand this application of muslim law is different thing application of muslim law would be uh, up, that shariat would be applicable only in 10 subject matters which are specifically mentioned in section 2 of this shariat act 1937 but one question which is always asked in pre examination or written mains examination that whether this statement is true or not this type of question is asked if both the party where both the parties are muslims they have contracted their marriage in accordance with the provision of special marriage act 1954 whether muslim personal law would be applicable whether shariat act 1937 would be applicable or they would be governed by different laws so answer would be negative they would be governed though they are muslims but since they have contracted their marriage under the special marriage act 1954 and that is popularly known as court marriage court marriage so if they have if both are muslims male as well as female both are muslims they have contracted their marriage in accordance with provision of special marriage act then in case <coughs> then in that case indian succession act 1925 would, would be applicable not muslim not muslim succession act would be applicable inheritance rule regarding inheritance of indian succession act 1925 would be applicable to both the muslims who have contracted their marriage under special marriage act 1954 in a otherwise if they have contracted their marriage in in accordance with uh, shariat act in accordance with the provision of muslim law so their marriage their maintenance their inheritance would be decided regulated by muslim succession law rules regarding succession inheritance which are prescribed in 
Muslim law. So, you all need to understand if uh, both Muslims, male and female, have contracted their marriage in accordance with provision of Special Marriage Act 1954, then maintenance, if problem regarding maintenance will arise between the parties, Muslim, that Muslim female, since she has contracted her marriage in under Special Marriage Act 1954, she would be entitled to get maintenance in accordance with the provision of section 125 CRPC, not under Muslim personal law, because it is the it is marital status of the parties which may deprive her to get benefit of that Muslim law. So, you all need to understand that once marriage is contracted in accordance with the provision of Special Marriage Act 1954, irrespective of caste, creed and religion of the parties, the personal law would not be applicable in that case. And the same case is with Muslims. If Muslims, Muslim male and female have contracted their marriage under Special Marriage Act 1954, the party would be regulated by common law, by general enactment of this country, not by Muslim personal law. So, this is another important thing which you need to understand. So, in that case, rules regarding maintenance, rule regarding divorce would be applicable to general rules regarding 125 CRPC would be applicable. And so, with this, I would like to conclude this lecture and I hope that you all have understood the things which I have just discussed in this lecture. So, thank you all.